Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark. And every week at this time, we bring you some science results from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, specializing primarily in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which today is really appropriate because I have not one, but three guests with me today. So let me introduce you to my immediate left. Here is Chemik Deer, who is a researcher within HIGP, Hannah Shelton, who is a graduate student, and Greg Finkelstein, who is a lab manager, and we're all at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And we're gonna be talking about mineral physics. And Chemek, I know you've been on the show before, you had a different host at that time, but just explain for the viewers, what do we mean by mineral physics? Aloha, Pete, and thank you for the invitation. We are uh, very happy to be here, and we thought we would come with a strong group to represent all of the important components of what we do. I was wondering if we could see the, the first uh, graphics. Okay, let's look at the first slide. So mineral physics, the discipline that we specialize in, uh, is a science about simplifying complex phenomena that are hard to understand and hard to uh, measure. We look at very complicated systems, such as whole planets. We look at important processes that affect these planets, you know, earthquakes, volcano eruptions, and so on. And we, we simplify it stage by stage. We look at geological formations of individual rocks. We look at what minerals form these formations. And then we focus on the molecular and atomic and level. for those who are just listening on the podcast, we're looking at a slide where we've got planet Earth on the left-hand side, some geology at the kilometer or mile scale, yeah. minerals at a few microns, which is less than a centimeter in size, and then molecules at an Armstrong size, right? Yes. So you study all of these scales with mineral physics? We focus on the right side of this, of this right graphics where, where you deal with atoms and bonds and, and basically chemistry. So we take apart something as complex as the Earth and, and try to explain uh, by means of you know, chemical and physical processes what is happening inside. Right. And we've had Bin Chen, who's your collaborator at the university on the show in the last few months, so you and Ben actually work together on different projects. Obviously, it's the same science that you're doing, correct? Yes, that's true. I mean, Earth is so complex that there's, there are many environments and many, many depths, many uh, types of rocks that, that you can study. Uh, what, what is uh, kind of a little bit more of a focus for me co compared to my colleague Ben is uh, I'm, I'm more of a material scientist. I'm a chemist by training. So, so for me, looking at uh, Earth science relevant phenomena that connect in some way with, uh, with materials that are relevant for technological applications that you find in your household. Okay. Um, that, that's something that we try to focus on and we learn lessons from how these earth materials operate to try to improve what we have right. in and our cell phones. was telling us so a lot about the interior mm -hmm. of the earth sure. and maybe some of the other solid planets like the moon or Venus and that sort of thing. So let's bring, you bring you and Greg, um, okay. it must be some pretty sophisticated kinds of equipment that you, you work on. Um, yes. I believe you brought along a, an illustration or two. We may have one, if uh, we could show we it on the, the screen, please. Slide. Yes. Um, it just looks like a classroom, but on the TV screen, you're obviously looking at something, trying to infer what... Oh yeah, so on the, on the screen we have a crystal structure, and um, this, is, this is our conference area. We use this to, um, to have conversations about the science that we're doing and to visualize crystal structures that we uh, look at in the lab. So if you, if you, move, on to the next, um, if you move on to the next slide, okay. now we have instruments. And, this looks much more. <laughs> and, and these facilities are at the University of Manoa. These are at the University of Manoa. They're in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics in that building, um, in our department. And we have... Um, We've got two different we have two, slides. We have two different instruments. Um, there's, see, there's a bigger one on the left and a smaller one on the right. And um, the inset on the, the right side of the screen is actually a zoomed-in picture of the instrument on the left. So what, what do these two 
pieces of kit too. So these instruments are both called X-ray diffractometers, but they're a little bit different. Um, so in our lab, the main technique that we use is we take X-rays and we shoot them at the rocks and crystals that we look at, and the X-rays interact with the electrons and the atoms in the crystal structures, and they can tell us about the um, what these, uh, the structure of these crystals, and sometimes about their physical properties as well, um, which uh, is what we're interested in learning about. Um, so, uh, th so these are glorified or more refined versions of an X-ray machine. That they are literally X-ray machines. When you go to the doctors or the dentist. Yes, but they're a little. They are. They're more refined versions of that. So, yeah. in particular, they focus down to much smaller sizes. So, oftentimes, you know, we saw a picture in one of the previous slides with like ten micron mm -hmm. scale bar. Um, oftentimes, our, our the crystals that we look at are on that scale, or on you know the, the ten to fifty um, micron scale, where. Um, way, way smaller than an inch in width. So yeah, yeah. Viewers who are um, not familiar with micron. One mi yeah, one micron is one millionth of a meter. Okay. So. So um, it's very, 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 we're talking about on the order of like the width of your hair right. and your head. So Hannah, you're a graduate yeah. student. Does Chemic actually let you loose on this kind of equipment? Oh, Is this absolutely. what you're doing for your thesis? Yes, yeah. So I am extremely lucky in that I get to use these beautiful brand new instruments as well as uh, stuff that we can do in Chicago at Argonne National Laboratory for my research. And I use the technique Greg just talked about, the X-ray diffraction instruments, to look at the structure of the minerals that are of interest. And, th and this is part of your PhD thesis? This is part of my PhD thesis, yeah. So I look at minerals at um, extreme conditions, so think high pressure, high temperature, conditions that you can't normally see on the Earth's surface. So on the interior of the Earth or in a meteorite impact, things like that. Okay. Now, Chemic, Hannah mentioned Chicago. Um, does this mean that Hawaii is collaborating with Chicago? I know there's um, various organizations throughout the country. Can you just explain a little bit more of the context? Is this a unique facility in Hawaii or part of a bigger group? Yeah, so we are fortunate in, in many different uh, uh, aspects of our operation. Uh, and I, I think this is uh, in large part thanks to the uh, support of diversity in Hawaii. So I think diversity can be understood on many different levels. Uh, in, in our case, it's a diversity of uh, different models of how, uh, how, how your research program is uh, uh, based on different instruments and how it uh, involves different uh, kind of scientific stuff. So we are, we are fortunate because uh, a lot of research, cutting edge research, research is really difficult to do in terms of technical barriers, requires that uh, your X-ray beam, the beam that these instruments produce, is really, really tiny. So the, the scale of human hair is, is uh, useful for a comparison. If you want to uh, simulate conditions that are present at planetary centers, you have to work with samples that are perhaps a tenth of the size of a human hair, so very, very tiny. Uh, with instruments like the ones in the lab that we have here, um, they are state of the art on their own. They are kind of uh, cutting edge and allow us to uh, develop new uh, customizations that enhance the functionality. But they are not uh, not sufficiently uh, um, sensitive and they don't have a sufficiently small beam for, for the most challenging experiments. So for these experiments, we have to travel to facilities, national uh, facilities that are funded by the Department of Energy. One of them, the one where we usually travel, is located in Chicago. It's called Argonne National yeah. Lab. So th the way in which we are fortunate is that we actually manage uh, one of the instruments at this facility. So my students get to participate in uh, both the development of the instrument in support of experiments done by people from other institutions, as well as, as be able to do their own research for Fascinating. Thesis. So, so what kind of skill sets do you three have? I mean, Hannah. Are you going to get a geology degree? Are you a physicist? Are you a chemist? Or, or, or? So my PhD, once I'm all done, will be in geology and geophysics because right. I primarily study the material science of minerals. Um, but my background, just like Chemex, is in chemistry. I'm a chemist by training. Uh -huh. And some of my research actually looks at chemistry that would be applicable to material science contexts at extreme conditions. But, but Greg, as the my background's a little bit different. You must be an engineer or a computer No, my background's scientist. geology, actually. And I came, and then I moved into material science. And you control these wonderful pieces of equipment? <laughs> yeah. as a, 
Yes, well, <laughs> I, I um, have spent the last decade or so learning, learning um, these techniques and the science behind them and learning how to use these instruments. So in grad school, actually, my degree is actually in geosciences and material science. It's a joint degree. And um, so I, I started with geology and then eventually got more interested in crystallography and material science. And now I am you know, running this lab and these instruments. But there must be a lot of engineering or computer programs. We, well, we, there, there, is, there is some, but you know, we, we also, these instruments are really complex. So, you know, while, while um, I, I run them a lot of myself, we also work with people, you know, the people who build these instruments yeah. to make sure that they're kept in, you know, you know tip-top shape. So, um, they, okay. well, this is quite a big group now. Yeah. It's growing. It requires, science requires a lot of collaboration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I think it's not just the x ray yeah. instruments we talked about. There's another slide of another piece of equipment. Maybe we can go on to the yeah. next slide. Oh, and, yeah. And, and here's another student of yours. Yeah, this is, this yeah. is the facility in Chicago that, that oh, we, this is in uh, Chicago. we managed. Okay. It's actually also an, an x ray instrument, but a little bit more flexible and versatile. It, it costs about 10 times as much as the one that we have. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is, this is something that allows us to do experiments that only a handful of people in the country can, can perform. And they give you access to these regimes of conditions that are really uh, unique. And sometimes, sometimes you, need something, you need something like this to, uh, to make a new material that will be harder than diamond or, or a better superconductor or something that is really uh, uh, useful. Those of you who have always watched this show will know one of my key questions is, why should anybody care about what you're doing? Well, I mean, this must be really expensive. It's super sophisticated work. Would any of you like to take a stab and say, what, why should the person in Hawaii worry about high pressure mineral physics? I can give you my old person's perspective on this, and maybe you can ask yeah, a Hannah, young student. Yeah, Hannah, you're going to start a career. So let, let, let your advisor go first. Yeah, so if, if you uh, I really like reading uh, books about uh, technological development of societies. If you look at the history of uh, the society in the United States, how, how the technology um, entered our lives at the level that we experience today, how cell phones became something indispensable, how uh, telecommunication over large distances became so easy. Th this is uh, built to a large extent by incremental improvements in materials that we deal with. Uh, you have to understand the basic phenomena that make uh, cell phones work and that right. you know, allow you to build small uh, microprocessor chips in, in your phones and computers and so on. So, so uh, what we contribute to this whole uh, society, to this whole world, is, is understanding of these basic phenomena and sometimes recipes for making materials that work much better. Okay, so we've had in the past people like Hopi Shi on the show who are talking about how you actually develop the materials which will then be employed in various uh, useful items. Uh, would you agree, Hannah? Is this why you're starting your career in mineral physics? Oh, totally. Um, just branching off of what Chemek said, to me, the mineral physics is, it's, it's the, one of the ways you can express material science of the earth, right? When we look at the properties of an individual mineral under extreme stresses, we're looking at its materials properties. And what people don't really know is that a lot of these material properties can be extrapolated to technology. So for instance, a type of mineral structure that was found in earth rocks can be used in uh, solar panels. And in addition to that, there are a lot of materials that are found underneath our feet that are used in cell phones, computers, you name it. So right. there's really this branching point that people don't think of when they so think the of geology. So the value of doing basic research then gets implemented as you're actually manufacturing processes, and that sort of thing. Well, we're getting close to the middle of break. So um, when we come back, I'd be really interested to understand a bit more about what the broader applications are in mineral physics. So let me just remind a few as you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and we'll be back in about a minute. See you then.
Living in this crazy world So caught up in the confusion Nothing is making sense And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and today I've got three guests, and we're all talking about mineral physics. Uh, camera right, we have Chemik Deera, who is a researcher, Hannah Shelton, who is a graduate student, and Greg Finkelstein, who is a lab tech, and they are all in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And we were just getting into some of the broader applications of mineral physics before the break. So, Chemik, can you sort of give us a, a, a broader view of where this discipline is at the university? Uh, yeah, so I, I think at uh, places like University of Hawaii, um, the strategy to be successful and, and be competitive on a national uh, scale is a little bit different than um, large and rich uh, universities. So in, in places like Hawaii, it pays off to uh, identify areas of emphasis or areas of excellence where you can um, kind of condense uh, talent and condense instrumentation, bring, bring it together, connect it, and, and then have it uh, have a larger impact. So I think our university is uh, quite good at, at uh, strategizing, at, at looking for uh, areas of, of strategic investments and strategic initiative. If we could uh, show for a moment the, the next slide. Um, we, we've had a, a discussion uh, at the university uh, about uh, which, which directions are, are worth special uh, special care in the next mm -hmm. few years. And so this diagram here, innovative materials and technologies for an adaptive future, and we've got a circular chart. Can you just walk us around the chart, please? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, in, in this project uh, that started with a call issued by the Office of Vice Chancellor for Research for, for uh, identifying uh, the most promising areas of uh, research investment, uh, we got a, a fairly broad group of people together, people including engineers, uh, uh, scientists involved in earth science research like, like uh, myself and uh, my group members, as well as people uh, involved in chemistry and physics research. And uh, we thought of uh, what we could put together, how we could contribute our talents, our instrumentation, our resources to form something that, that has a good connection with, uh, with uh, societal uh, you know, issues, with uh, environmental issues, with things that are relevant for the state, for the country. So we, we thought about this project which emphasizes material science in developments of, of innovative materials that could solve future needs of our So society. on this diagram down at the mm -hmm. bottom, the orange focused research activity, you're then talking about the arrow going to the green Dark, broader impact of research, knowledge, and society. Is that right? Uh, so you, you have to start with some goals. So you, you set the goals right. of, of some specific process or some specific setting where you want to contribute your your research. You you build the uh, educational program around it. So uh, you custom tailor your classes to what the students, when they graduate, will need to find employment in and, places. Where and this isn't. Mm -hmm an idea, you actually got funding from the university to develop this concept, correct? This is kind of a project in, in progress. So we, we have some startup funding from the university that allowed us to define the, the, the group of collaborators, faculty members who want to work on this together. We are uh, in the process of applying for funding from Hannah, federal this must sources. be really exciting to be a graduate student in a group where you're not just talking to geologists, but you might actually get engaged with people across campus, whether it's an engineer or chemist or whomever. You know, what's it like being a graduate student in this activity? Oh, gosh. I, as we pointed out before, we have access to these really uh, state-of-the-art instrumentation abilities that allow us to do our own research. But in addition to that, like you just mentioned, I get to talk to people from civil and mechanical engineering, from chemistry, from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, all sorts of different collaborative projects, which not only are tied into my research, but can go forward in trying to do projects like sustainability or construction-related uh, 
things in Hawaii. So there's both a national and a local focus. But that must make Greg's job even more challenging because you're talking to all of these people. I'm a geologist, and if I came to use one of these X-ray uh, instruments, I wouldn't know where to start. That's where, that's where I come in. And that's where you come in, is that right? Yeah. So how do we view training the university community to utilize these state-of-the-art pieces of equipment? I mean, is that one of the challenges you're facing? Yeah, so I, I, in the last couple months, I've worked with people from oceanography, um, from, from geophysics, from geology, from civil engineering, from the um, uh, Energy Institute. And they all presumably have different they are, they research have, goals. They have different that? research goals. Yeah. We've, I've worked on, you know, we've worked on batteries, on thin films, on um, you know sediments from like deep ocean drilling bores, um, and you know people come in with varying levels of expertise. You know sometimes we come in with experts, and sometimes we come in with undergraduates mm -hmm. who just you know need to learn the basics of what is a you know what what how do X rays interact with 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 rocks? Yeah. Um, and so you know we, we I mean it's exciting for me because I you know I get to talk different subject matter with different people and I'm exposed to different um, you know, exciting scientific um, opportunities, but um, you know, it's important to I, I try and take it on an individual level and you know, meet people wh where they are in terms of their expertise. So you know, it, it helps connect the community by having these sort of central facilities. Um, that that sure. Can... And, and, and Hannah, and you're yeah. close to defending your your thesis, right? Yep. Yeah. This must open up a number of career goals. I understand that you. Went to high school and college in Hawaii? I did, so yes. So you're a homegrown scientist. I am. Where do you see the opportunities that UH has provided taking your career? Because there's many different options, correct? There's a bunch of different options. So not only could I go forth in a kind of traditional geology and geophysics track, but uh, there's opportunities to work in um, very, very uh, well-funded and large uh, government organizations like the Department of Energy, um, the Army, as well as other you know, industry-related fields that you wouldn't normally associate with yeah. you know, the Department of Geology and Geophysics. And the viewers would be interested to hear you, you've got an award from the Geology Department and you won a prize at some yeah, so... DOE course. Can you tell <laughs> us a bit about this? Because this is really exceptional. A Hawaii high school student has now matured, getting a PhD, and you're really doing well in the national community. So for one of the projects that I'm working on, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to earn um, the Fred Bullard Award through the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Mm -hmm. And for the same project, I was able to present at a uh, conference run by the Department of Energy called the SSAP Symposia. And this project revolved around looking at uh, some very unusual structures of SiO2, silica. Okay, sand. Sand, yeah, yeah okay. essentially. So everybody associates silica with sand or glass. But what people don't really realize a lot of times is that that same molecule also makes quartz. It also makes a bunch of different mineral types that uh, have different material properties and different potentially relevant technological applications. So I was looking at a very uh, unusual and very little understood form of this silica that hasn't been understood for 20 years or so. People have been arguing about the structure. And this was something DOE was particularly interested in or saw the potential at least? Yeah, so the Department of Energy is particularly interested in technologically relevant things, um, but it's also interested in what they call extreme conditions, material science. So the Department of Energy looks at a lot of uh, high energy interactions, think you know, nuclear fusions, things like that. So anything that looks at material properties of things at these extreme conditions is of interest to them. Well, it sounds a fascinating career, but Chemik, where do we go next? I mean, <laughs> are we covering all the bases? You've, you've just set up this collaboration across campus. You know, where do you see mineral physics going in the next five years or so? Could, could we see the last, uh, sure. the last graphics? Yeah, so I'm very excited about this interaction and, and the collaborative opportunity on campus. 
Uh, we are trying to emphasize this multidisciplinarity. Right. And let's explain what it is we're, we're <laughs> yeah. seeing here, so, some, some colored footballs. Yeah, so on the left side we have a, a graph that, that shows what we are trying to combine in one pot to brew something that is really impactful on a societal uh, or global scale. So we, we put together our basic material science research where we play with materials and try to change them and tune them. We combine this with computer simulations, materials informatics, which utilizes uh, supercomputers and allows us to do things that you cannot physically do in experiments easily. And we try to connect this with the engineering side where you would actually take this knowledge and, and make it into a device that you can, you can put in a factory and, and uh, okay, put to so work. Okay, so the left-hand diagram would basically cover three different parts of the university. College of Engineering, mm -hmm. Green, whether it's chemistry department or yes. physics in orange in the middle, and then the informatics is the computer sciences. That's right, that's right. right. So this is what the Vice Chancellor for Research encourages you to work on, right? It's, it seems so, yes. We, we also <laughs> emphasize this uh, pedagogical model of a T-shaped uh, curriculum. So, so it, it emphasizes that, that you have to maintain a balance between the disciplinary depth so how good a student is at using a particular instrument in lab and understanding how it works and what you can get out of it, with breadth that, that the student has to understand the, inter, the, the context, you know, in, in terms of sure. uh, society and so on, how it connects with, with uh, engineering and with, uh, with other things. And, and from Greg's point of view, presumably we, we have to have these trained technicians, support personnel, and we need the professors who are actually teaching classes both, would this primarily be at the graduate level the courses would be taught or undergraduate as well? So let, let me just clarify, G Greg is not the laboratory technician, he's, he's a PhD level uh, scientist who, oh, okay. uh, who <laughs> manages our Manage, facilities. He's a lab uh, manager. So, so with uh, instrumentation as sophisticated as what we have in lab, really have to have top-notch people to operate it. Right. So in Greg's I, case... I apologize. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, he's, we'll uh, just give you a pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, what enabled us to, to really take advantage of what Greg could contribute is his, you know, uh, undergraduate education at Princeton and, and uh, at graduate postgraduate education at, at Caltech. But yeah, it, it all comes together very nicely. We have a team of about 10 people in our group right now uh -huh. that grew from zero in about five years. I think we do things that are well connected. People like working with us. We have extensive collaborations on campus and off campus. Uh, I, I think the shape of this interdisciplinary consortium that focuses on materials uh, has enough connections to uh, state agencies, to uh, you know, things that, that really impact everyday life, that, that there's a good future. And I think there's, uh, because of this interdisciplinarity, just like what Hannah was saying, uh, the, the number of uh, professional development options past your graduation is really significant. So it really sounds as if mineral physics has a very bright future at the university and nationally as well. I, I'm an optimist and uh, it has been a very vibrant field where really exciting uh, you know, discoveries come almost weekly. So. Perfect. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So let me thank Chemik, Hannah and Greg for being on the show and to remind the viewers you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host Pete McGuinness-Mark and we've been hearing all about mineral physics and Hannah let me just wish you success with your PhD defense Thank as you well as your future career and Greg Apologies again. <laughs> I will promote you accordingly. And thank you as well, Chami. Thank you very much. Until next week, we'll see you then. Goodbye.